Hi, welcome to Fundamentals Friday. Today we're going to take a look at op amp voltage noise. Now, this can be a real big can of worms, so I'm going to only open it just a little bit today, and we're going to take a look at one of the more confusing parameters on an op amp data sheet, and that's input noise voltage density and input noise voltage. If you didn't know, well, you do now, that any op amp is going to have inherent noise in it, just like all components and all wires and everything else has inherent noise within it. And the op amp is no different, and that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, we're not going to take a look at anything around the circuit, the resistor noise and other components and stuff like that, just what's inherent in the op amp. And to do that, we're going to start by taking a look at a typical data sheet. Now let's take a look at the OP07, a typical precision op amp, not particularly low noise, but it is one of the Jelly Bean precision devices. Now um, it has a parameter here called input voltage noise, and that's the noise effectively on the input. And the units are very easy, they're microvolts in peak to peak, and it's uh, called E. N or uh, VN, depending on the data sheet, could be called other things, but they're just uh, typical labels for it. And you know, that figure might be familiar to you, and it's fairly easy to understand. Okay, I've in the case of the OPPO 7, we've got 0.35 microvolts peak to peak input noise. So if we've got a voltage follower like this with a gain of one, we're going to get an output noise or an inherent noise in our op amp uh, in our. Uh, complete amplifier here of that 0.35 microvolts peak to peak. Real easy to understand, but there's a catch. Take a look at the conditions that that value is measured over, and it's actually 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz bandwidth. And you might be uh, familiar with this from power supply specs, for example. They might specify the output noise of your bench lab power supply over typically a 20 megahertz bandwidth. Well, in this case, it's a very small low frequency bandwidth, and we'll find out why later. It's 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz, and this is typically how they measure it. They've uh, got the op amp here. It may have, some, may or may not uh, have some gain. Uh, the input will be grounded. It'll all be shielded, of course. And then we'll have a bandpass filter of 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz. We'll have some more gain in there because we're talking about low signal levels. That'll go into a scope, and they can measure that value and they'll give you a peak-to-peak, -peak, or a maximum peak-to-peak -peak signal, and they'll also give you, take a look at this also in, the, in most data sheets, they'll also give you a typical waveform as well. Once again, that's the bandwidth limited to 0.1 to 10 hertz very limited frequency range. So that's well and good if you're operating down in that frequency range in your circuit. Fantastic, you've got this real world figure here, you understand it, it's easy, it's a peak maximum voltage, and you know uh, what your system noise is going to be, at least just due to the op amp. Very simple. But what happens if you want to actually operate typically over a larger frequency range? Well, we get into something a bit more complicated called input noise voltage density. You'll notice it's exactly the same, but they've added this word density. And if we go back to the data sheet and take a look at some typical figures for the OP07, what do we get? Well, look, you can see that the conditions there, there's three different values, and these are called the spot frequency values. In this case, we've got 10 hertz, 100 hertz, and 1 kilohertz, and we've got different figures for that, 10.3, 10, and 9.6 respectively. And you'll notice how it's slightly higher at lower frequencies, and that's important, which we'll take a look at in a minute. But it uses these bizarre units, which confuses a lot of people, and it's nanovolts per root hertz. And here it is. Once again, it's labeled exactly the same, EN, VN, exactly the same, but instead of microvolts peak to peak, we've now got a value in nanovolts per root hertz. What does that mean? In a nutshell, it's spectral density, i.e. the density of the noise over a specific spectrum or frequency range, just like our input voltage noise was measured from 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz. It needs a, these, this unit here actually needs a frequency range over which it's going to be valid, otherwise it's a meaningless figure. Now the confusing part about these units of nanovolts per root hertz is that you go, well, what kind of units 
is that? Well, it's just voltage. It's, you know, even though it's called nanovolts per root hertz, the per root hertz part just specifies that it's defined over a frequency range because that's its spectral density. Now, so we've basically, it is just a voltage. That's all there is to it. Now, the data sheet, for example, for this one at a specific frequency has, for example, 10 nanovolts per root hertz. Now, it's very important to understand that this is not divided by root hertz, it's per root hertz. And it's actually uh, referenced to one hertz. So it's 10 nanovolts for every one hertz of bandwidth. And that's the key to understanding this thing. So if you've only got a one hertz bandwidth, then your noise is gonna be square root of one hertz, which is the same 10 nanovolts. But you know, usually you're not gonna be operating over a one hertz bandwidth. So let's look at it, one kilohertz bandwidth. And the formula then is F max minus F min. That's a little bit complicated, but it's basically the bandwidth you're operating under. So if you operate circuit uh, is operating from zero hertz up to one kilohertz, then you've got a bandwidth of you know, one kilohertz minus zero is one kilohertz. 10 nanovolts times the square root of one kilohertz gives you a final value of 316 nanovolts. Easy. That's how much noise RMS, by the way, this is all RMS noise in your op amp, inherent in your op amp. Just like this value up here was microvolts, but it was specified in peak to peak. This one up here, nanovolts per root hertz, specified in RMS. So you can see that the higher frequency range you operate over, the more noise you're gonna have because it's multiplied by the square root of the frequency. If we operate over 10 kilohertz there, it's gonna be bigger noise once again, or 100 kilohertz or a megahertz. The next important thing to understand is this is what is called input referred noise or equivalent input noise. You'll see these terms are various different uh, types of terminology, but it means that this is the noise on the, the equivalent noise on the input of the op amp. So what that means is it gets always gets multiplied by the gain of the op amp. In this case, we've just got a gain of one. So in the case of this uh, op 07, 316 nanovolts RMS on the input, same 316 nanovolts RMS noise on the output, pretty low noise. But if you suddenly whack in a gain of a thousand in there, AV equals a thousand, Bingo, you've gone from 316 nanovolts to 316 microvolts, or 0.3 millivolts. Much higher noise. Now, if you remember, I said this was RMS. So how do you convert it to possibly a more useful uh, maximum peak-to-peak -peak value in your system? Well, this one gets a bit fuzzy, and you have to introduce probability. Now, what we're talking about here is uh, white noise, or you know, purely random noise, which has your typical Gaussian response like this, and we won't go into hugely into types of noise, but it has that Gaussian response. Now I've drawn a voltage here, I've rotated the axes like that, so positive and negative voltage, noise can always be equally positive and negative, it doesn't just go positive, and basically uh, the peak value, so this is just a typical voltage peak like this over time. So. As you can see, you know, the noise is completely random. And what are these peak values here going to be? This is where you get into that probability term sigma. Now, if we look at the value of uh, uh, plus minus three sigma there, basically what that means is that we have a 99.9% .9 confidence or close to it that the peak to peak noise is gonna be within that specific value. So that uh, three sigma value, what you, to get that, that's a typical figure quoted. So manufacturers might uh, typically define the convert RMS to peak to peak by using a multiplier of times six or times 6.6. 6.6 .6 will give you 99.9% uh, .9 probability the noise falls within a certain range, but it doesn't guarantee it. There's a 0.1% chance can be outside that. And well, it's up to you as the system to de designer to determine what probability you need, but that's a good ballpark. So multiply that value by about six or 6.6. .6. So in our example of a th gain of a thousand here, what's our output noise for this op 07 with 10 nanovolts per root hertz specified? Well, it's gonna be the output 
is going to be 316 microvolts RMS or around about 2.1 millivolts peak to peak with a good confidence level. And that is going to be your output noise just solely due to your op amp not taking into account any other components or any other part of your circuit. So that's really quite easy to understand once you know. Just multiply that figure by the square root of your bandwidth and you get your output noise in RMS. Very simple. But yeah, there's more to it. Let's go a little bit deeper. Open that can of worms just a little bit more. And yes, hold on to your hat. We're going into a graph of noise voltage versus frequency here on dual log axes. So we've got our nanovolts per root hertz here versus frequency. And as I said, log axes, that's important. So 10 hertz, 100 hertz, and it's not a linear increase. Same with frequency, 10, 100, 1K, and then it's your typical log axes you uh, should be familiar with. So the black line there is our noise voltage, and you will find this, uh, typically find this curve in the data sheet as well. And it'll always be in this particular form. And here's where the trick with all this op amp voltage noise comes in. That we've effectively got two different types of noise in our op amp, and they effectively split into different parts of the frequency spectrum. The higher frequency, say from around 10 hertz or 100 hertz up, typically is going to be your Gaussian white noise that we showed before, and effectively what we're using up there for our input noise voltage density. That's our white noise up there. But all op amps, regardless of the type, are going to have this characteristic response that tails up at low frequencies. And this is called one-on F noise. So white noise dominates at higher frequencies, one-on F noise dominates at lower frequencies, usually you know, around about 10 hertz or lower, or that figure. That's why our input voltage noise here peak to peak was specified over that 10 hertz range because they're really looking at the one on F noise there, the low frequency stuff. Whereas our voltage density is looking at the higher frequency noise up here. And yeah, they are two different things. So when we were actually uh, calculating this input noise uh, noise density over here for a zero to one kilohertz range, we were actually including this lower part down here. But because the frequency range we were uh, working over because it's log axis is so large, pretty much you can ignore this tail up end and you know we can stick with the ballpark figures we got over here for our noise voltage density over that entire frequency range. And we won't go into specific details of the types of noise because there are uh, quite a few different types, but suffice it to say that the white noise, the high frequency stuff is made up a combination of shot noise and thermal or junction or Johnson noise, as you may have heard it called. And the one on F noise is also referred to as pink noise, and that's due to uh, what's called flicker noise, but it's more typically just called one on F noise. And that's the trap with components. You can't escape this one on F noise. It's just inherent in nature. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. There are things you can do in the process uh, of manufacturing your devices to, you know, to reduce the uh, flicker noise, but pretty much you're going to cop it at that low frequency range. So you might think these op amps are less noisy at DC. Well, that's not the case. As you can see, they get much, much noisier at DC. They're lower noise at the higher frequencies. It doesn't make sense, but hey, a lot of things in physics don't make sense. <laughs> Next thing we know, we're talking about spooky action at a distance. <sighs> now, Gaussian white noise like shot and thermal noise has a uniform power density. What that means is that it's going to be the same value regardless of the frequency, and that's why we get a flat line in there for that. But one on F noise is not a uniform uh, power density, so that's why we get basically a flat line, a straight line like that, but it has a specific slope, 3 dB per octave, but uh, we won't go into the details. And this all comes back to why our input noise voltage density was uh, specified in the data sheet at three particular frequencies, 1 kilohertz, 100 hertz, and 10 hertz. It's so that you can do comparisons with other op amps of how this uh, noise changes and how well it performs 
over a frequency range like that. Because if you see a large change, for example, between 100 hertz and 10 hertz in, for one op amp and hardly any difference for another op amp, then you know that that second op amp with the same figure right down to 10 hertz is going to be a better op amp. And that's basically a deciding factor. That corner frequency that we've got there, that effectively determines um, how good your op amp effectively is. The lower that corner frequency, the better your op amp, and that's the one you're most likely going to choose, all things being equal. And as always with data sheets, the marketers are gonna fudge the numbers to give you the best possible banner spec. So beware, you have to actually go in there and look at the graphs, look at the individual data and compare op amps. And it can actually be pretty hard to compare op amps just from the data sheets. Not that easy. So you gotta be careful and know how to design it into your system. And you'll also notice on the data sheet that there's an identical noise spec for current as well. So it's input uh, noise current density and input noise current. And we won't go into that. That's the current into the input to the op amp. So at the moment, as I said, we're only looking at the voltage scenario. But hey, if you've got significant input currents, you have to take the input current noise into account as well in those really critical low noise circuits. But the same sort of fundamental theory applies. And yes, it's all gonna add up with the voltage noise as well. So you just gotta be careful. And by the time you actually practically build the circuit up, usually, usually the external components are gonna dominate your circuit more than the op amp itself. But hey, that's why they spec these things because a lot of critical applications you have to get the lowest noise op amp possible. And that's what it's all about, frequency range. Remember how much noise density within that one hertz window. And when you extrapolate these two lines here to get that uh, corner frequency crossing point where they intersect, if you extrapolate that down, then we've got, uh, there's 10 hertz, there's 20 hertz. So it's somewhere in there, let's say about 15 hertz is our corner frequency for this example we've drawn here, then that 15 hertz point is the point where the value of the white noise is equal to the value of the one on F no or noise. And of course, if you sum them together, let's say it's uh, 10 there as shown, then you don't get 10 plus 10, of course, you get 10 times the square root of two. So you get about 14.1. So there you go, that probably took a bit longer than I expected and there's a lot more detail in here as well. But suffice it to say, for your basic op amp like that, if you're working from DC, if it's all DC coupled and your full bandwidth is from DC to one kilohertz, for example, you effectively do have to take in to account these two different types of noise and you've got to sum them together. And when you add noises together, it's actually the root of the sum of the squares. So it's the square root of uh, this noise here, squared plus this noise here, squared, and you've got to add them together and that gives you total noise. But as we said right at the start, this is just the noise inherent in the op amp itself. It doesn't include the resistors here, which of course have that uh, thermal uh, Johnson noise. You might be familiar with that classic equation. The higher the resistor value, the more thermal noise you're gonna get in the resistor and all sorts of other stuff in your circuit. So it can get really complicated, but I hope you found that really, it is pretty easy to understand what nanovolts per root hertz is and how to calculate your noise. Very simple. This is a bit more detailed of how it actually works, but let's go and see if we can actually measure exactly this graph to the bench. And what tool do you use to measure the input noise voltage of something like an op amp? Well, you use a dynamic signal analyzer or DSA, which we've seen in the previous videos. And this is my HP 35660A DSA. They go from DC to about 100 kilohertz. Perfect for characterizing the uh, and seeing the one on F noise and power spect spectral density of the noise in something like an op amp or any other circuit. It's the tool of choice. But unfortunately, this uh, 35660A isn't exactly the world's best performance. Its noise floor isn't that great in itself. So that's what we'll do first. We'll just measure the noise floor of this unit itself with a 50 ohm terminator on the input, of course, on channel one here, and we'll uh, see what we get. 
but it's not going to be that crash hot. But it should be good enough to at least allow us to see differences between uh, different types of op amps. So I'll just run through you briefly how to set up a dynamic signal analyzer to measure power spectral uh, density on a low voltage uh, signal like this. Now when you first turn it on, by default here, we've got our frequency spectrum like this. It's displaying our frequency spectrum from 0 hertz down here to 102.4 kilohertz. And we're only uh, looking at channel 1, so there's a span. The record length is uh, 3.9 milliseconds for each one of those. And on our y-axis here, we have uh, dB volts. RMS. Whoop, there we go, it's doing its uh, auto calibration and we've got a figure, you know, down around that 130 minus 131 dB volts RMS mark. The first thing we have to do, because we're measuring low signal levels, go input, so I've selected the input button on the front and then channel 1 range. At the moment it's auto ranging, we really don't want that, we want it to um, just be fixed. And this thing, I'm pressing the up down arrow keys and as you can see, there you go, the channel 1 range up there, the uh, highest gain range or the lowest voltage range it's got is minus, minus 51 dB volts RMS and that's equivalent to I think about 4 millivolts uh, uh, peak or thereabouts. Next thing we want to do is turn on some averages so I'll press the average button on the front and then we want to turn average on like that because otherwise we'll just get you know we want a smoother line. See what happens when you turn the average on there? It's set for 10 I'm going to change that to number of averages there and I'm going to enter 100 averages. So now when you press the start button and we start our acquisition, there we go, it's giving us a bit of a plot already and we can already see that we're getting a result. Here it is, there's our pretty much flat line with the big 1 on F noise tailing up at the bottom. But why didn't it look like the whiteboard? Well, because we haven't plotted uh, the frequency on a log plot yet. It's a linear plot. It's a linear axis, sorry. Speaking of which, we have to go uh, to the input here, set it up, and just make sure we've uh, got a DC coupling here. We want to go all the way down to DC. So to change that to a log graph, we press the scale button on the front here, and here it is, x-axis. There it is, currently set to linear. We'll change that to log, and bingo! Look at that, we're starting to get exactly the response that we wanted. Now, the reason why it's um, there's not many data points down here because it has to do with the number of lines in the uh, FFT response to this thing. Now, we've got a full uh, span here of 102.4 kilohertz, and this particular instrument only has uh, 400 lines of resolution. So, if you divide um, 102.4 kilohertz into 400, you will get. If we move our marker across here, you'll notice that. Um, each step, it can only measure at those frequency points there. So it's very coarse down there, of course, and you'll find that the uh, lowest step down there is going to be 1 400th of 102.4 kilohertz. So 102.4K divided by 400, there we go, gives us 256 hertz, where our marker is all the way over there. What's our marker X? There it is. 256 hertz so it can only jump up in 256 hertz steps because that's all the FFT resolution we've got there and of course that it really shows up when you've got the log x-axis like that didn't really show up on the linear one because then it'd be stepping in 400 even linear increments across the screen now if I press the measurement data button on the uh, front panel here, we're in what's called uh, well, just normal uh, frequency spectrum mode, more correctly referred to as linear spectrum mode, and that gives us a uh, voltage response here, and as we saw before, dB volts RMS there, minus 123. And if we plug that into the calculator, minus 123, and then we divide, because it's in dB, remember, if you want to convert it to a voltage, then we divide it by 20, and then we take the inverse log of that, and we've got ourselves 708 nanovolts. But what does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything, because that isn't our uh, power spectral density. So we'll press the scale button on the front and we'll have a look at the vertical units which we've got here, dB volts RMS at the moment, and as you can see there is no option for that uh, voltage per root hertz because we're in the linear spectrum mode, we're not, in a, do it, we're not actually calculating the power spectrum density. 
but that doesn't mean that this graph isn't correct because it actually is the shape of this graph is absolutely uh, bang on to what we will get in the power spectrum density except our units aren't, uh, up here aren't correct where dB volts RMS instead of that uh, voltage per uh, per root hertz. So how do we do that? Uh, well, how do we convert it? Well, we can do it manually. We can do all the math ourselves to convert between the linear spectrum and the power spectrum density, but uh, we don't need to do that. What we can do is go into the press the measurement data on the front. This thing will do it for us. That's what these dynamic signal analyzers are designed to do. Measure this noise specifically. And there it is, PSD mode or power spectrum density. Bingo! If we go into power spectrum density, you'll notice that the graph hasn't changed at all. And, and normally when you change mode, it rescales things, but it hasn't. The graph has stayed exactly the same. But look what we've got now. It's got a little asterisk next to it here. And that asterisk means, there it is, volts RMS per root hertz. And if we go back, that's exactly what we want. Exactly what we saw on the whiteboard. And if we go back into the measurement uh, sorry, the scale here into our vertical units, we'll see because we're now in the power spectrum density mode that we've got root hertz options here. Volts RMS squared, dB volts RMS per root hertz, hertz or volts per root hertz. That's what we want. Volts, well we want nanovolts, but volts per root hertz is the same thing. It'll scale for us. So bingo, look at what we've got now. Now, and that value there at uh, 10 kilohertz, close to 10 kilohertz, is now switched over and it's calculated that it's 28 e to the minus 9, that's nano of course, nanovolts per root hertz. Bingo, we've now got our DSA to uh, check its own performance because we've, uh, remember we've got a 50 ohm terminator on the front and there it is. That's what it is after 100 averages down here over that uh, well, at the moment, the full span from 0 to 102 kilohertz. So, as you can see, this instrument, um, you know, is <laughs> worse than a basic, uh, you know, op 07 op amp. 28 nanovolts per root hertz. And as we saw on the data sheet before, uh, just a basic op 07 is around, you know, a, a spot frequency. Um, in this case, 10 kilohertz. It only goes up to one I, I think, uh, but yeah, you know, because it's flat, it's going to be exactly the same. It had a figure of around 10 nanovolts per root hertz. So this thing isn't good enough to measure the performance of an OP07. The way you normally do it, although it is, you could actually use this instrument, the way you would normally do it is use an external, uh, extremely low noise purpose designed amplifier to amplify the noise before it gets into this instrument. So you use this instrument, um, you've already gained it up, so you bring it way above the noise floor of this instrument and then you can, you know, if it's got times 100 gain, then you can just, you know, change the units to compensate for that and you can actually measure the performance of an OP07. Now if we take our cursor all the way over to uh, the corner frequency down there, uh, once again, we're very coarse because we're measuring the whole 102 kilohertz bandwidth. It's, it's telling us the corner frequency is about 1 kilohertz, but I know that's not going to be the case. What we want to do is change the span so we get more detail down on this 1 on F region instead of just three crappy three data points. And that's easy. You just press the frequency button on the front. You can see these DSAs are specifically designed for these types of measurements. They're optimized for it. This is what they're designed to do. Anyway, we can just go span like this, press the span button, and then we can uh, just type in, say, well, no, let's do 1000 hertz. We'll do a kilohertz range, and then it's going to restart. You can see it's automatically restarted and it'll do the RMS averages. It takes longer, of course, because it's lower frequency, so it takes a quarter of a second per record uh, length like that. But there you go. This one has actually dropped off the screen, so I think we've done something with our input scale in there. So if we press our scale button there, we can just auto scale that and bang, that's going to bring it in line like that. And look at that. Look at that. We can now, uh, one, that cursor, we can now put it at one kilohertz. There you go, so it's at one kilohertz there, and we're getting a value of about 31 
uh, nanovolts per root hertz. That's the noise floor of this thing. As I said, not very spectacular. In fact, I want to investigate, open this thing up, uh, have a look at the op amps used in this and other components and see if I can actually use modern uh, drop-in high performance op amps to actually um, increase the performance of this thing. So uh, I'll leave that to a future video. But you can see it's essentially flat and it starts to tail up a bit there. You can see it just starting to go up. So you can see um, because we're effectively measuring the uh, noise of the um, input noise of the uh, the input section or the input op amps inside this particular instrument. So we'll get exactly the same result if we were measuring an external op amp effectively. So the value at one kilohertz here is going to be slightly lower than the value at 100 hertz, which once again is going to be uh, uh, lower than the value at 10 hertz here and that's why they have those three spot values on the data sheet 1 kilohertz, 100 hertz and then 10 hertz over here and of course that will be a continue basically completely flat out to that 100 kilohertz we saw uh, last time but you can see it pretty much starting to get bad at just under 200 hertz there I've put it on 160 hertz for a reason because let's go to the data sheet for this HP DSA and here it is, straight out of the user manual on the minus 51 dB volt range, i.e. the highest gain range which we've got, source impedance of 50 ohms, which we've got 16 RMS averages, well we've done 100. You'll notice that it doesn't specify anything under 160 Hz. It's got that 160 Hz to that 1 kilohertz range is minus 130 dB volts per hertz and of course you if you wanted to you have to convert that to the power spectrum density which we can do which we've just done with the instrument itself so there you go that's why they've got the figure of 160 hertz in there because it its performance really starts under that 160 hertz you know it really starts to be a bit how you doing and one thing I want you to take note of, near 50 hertz there, you'll notice that we're getting no 50 hertz pickup at all. And of course, this lab is just swimming in 50 hertz mains frequency because, as we saw in the teardown of this thing, it's incredibly well shielded and we've just got a 50 ohm terminator on the front. But as I think we'll see when we try and measure a practical circuit, we're going to get at least some 50 hertz pickup. It's almost unavoidable. Okay, so let's take note after 100 averages at our marker frequency of 1 kilohertz because that's a value we can get from the data sheet for some op amps. We're getting 31.3 nanovolts per root hertz. So that's the basic noise floor of our DSA here. And of course to measure noise floors like this you need a Faraday cage, you need a shielded box, one of these die cast alloy boxes, absolutely fantastic sort of industry standard way to measure these things. A little mini breadboard in there with a um, TL072 on it and I've got two 9 volt batteries now. If you look at the data sheet the voltage uh, uh, the noise uh, for these uh, for all these chips is usually specified at say plus minus 15 uh, volts or sort of maximum rail uh, it's going to be near enough plus minus 9 now of course once you uh, put the lid on this sucker there's no way anything is getting in there at all we've got our nice BNC on there we've got a shielded coax all the way to the input Bob's your uncle and of course you do want to use batteries internal to the box. You don't want to be using an external power supply or any type of switching power supply or anything like that. Batteries, the only way to do it. And you'll notice, no, I don't need any decoupling on there. It's good enough uh, because we've got the uh, low impedance battery directly and this thing ain't going to oscillate. So we've got our box hooked up with the TL072 in it. Now I chose the TL072 because it's not a particularly uh, low noise op amp, about uh, 18 nanovolts per root hertz at that 1 kilohertz figure straight from the data sheet. Because it's not designed for noise, it only has the figure at 1 kilohertz. It really, you know, it's not that great. It doesn't really specify it in depth. But here we go. So that is the noise floor of our DSA. Let's press start and we will get using the exact same parameters we set up before. Remember 31.3 nanovolts per root hertz. Now of course that is below, so the noise that we're trying to measure here of this TL072 is below the noise floor of this DSA. But aha, uh -huh, remember that they sum together. So we should see an increase there. Let's press start and away we go and woohoo! 
look at that one on F noise has gone right off the scale there and look at that bump what frequency do you reckon that is 50 Hertz bang on where are we picking up our 50 Hertz from it ain't through the box it's through the shield of the coax that's the only place it can be getting in I don't know this is a you know RG 59 cable or something I don't know just a cheap one I had lying around so uh, yeah you're really even with fully shielded coaxes and that shielded box we get in our 50 Hertz pickup but anyway look we've got almost got a hundred averages there we go we've gone up from uh, 31.3 nanovolts per root Hertz to 38.028 uh, 38 uh, nanovolts per root Hertz at 1 kilohertz so it's gone up by about 7 nanovolts per root Hertz and what value should have we expected? Well, 31.3 nanovolts per root hertz, the base noise floor we had there. We've got to square that. Remember the formula we had on the whiteboard before? And then we've got sum of the squares. So we've got to add in the data sheet value, typically 18 nanovolts per root hertz at 1 kilohertz. So, uh, yeah, let's square that. And then get the square root we should get around about 36.1 and we're getting 38.1 you know 38 so you know near enough there you go we were able to see a difference with that TL072 now let's get one that's even worse 42 nanovolts per root hertz it's a TL062 it's an absolute shocker I've put it in there let's press start and there we go Whoa we still get our 50 Hertz of course horrible one on F noise gone off the scale here but there we go oh it's massive now look at that in the order of you know 75 nanovolts per root Hertz awful there we go after 100 averages 68.1 is that correct I don't know uh, what is it 31.3 squared which is the noise floor of our DSA plus the nominal 42 uh, from the data sheet and then we can uh, get that and then we square root that we expect it around about 52.3 and we're well above that so that one's not working out too great really is an ancient chip though trust me it's like 25 years old or something let me check the date code there's actually not a date code on that but uh, this one's actually uh, like I had this one since I was a kid and uh, it was actually desoldered from a board so it's ancient and shocking um, but anyway it allows us just to show the difference there what a crappy op amp can make and how you can measure it and I've now put in an analog device as AD712 uh, the identical uh, 18 nanovolts per root hertz of our uh, TL071 so let's give that one a bell and see what we get still get our big 50 hertz but uh, there we go we're getting yeah about 40 odd not too dissimilar to what we were getting with the uh, TL072 and as I said, if we really wanted to measure the performance of these op amps properly, I would have to use an external amplifier in here. I'd have to really design it properly. And ironically, you need an incredibly, uh, you know, low noise amplifier in there to measure low noise. Imagine trying to measure the state of the art op amps. Well, you've got to be very careful in how you roll the input uh, amplifiers. And we would still be able to measure it easily once we've got, you know, some gain in that box to uh, get well above the noise floor there and actually be able to measure uh, properly the absolute performance of the op amps. But anyway, I hope you found that interesting. We were able to see the differences between some op amps there. And if I put in a really schmick op amp in there, we would have actually uh, seen it drop to pretty much the same noise floor as this particular uh, DSA. So there you go. If you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. And uh, I hope you liked the video. And if you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time. Wait, hang on. I found an NE5534 uh, op amp. Really uh, good audio, low noise audio op amp. I think they even use a couple of them in here from what I uh, saw on the schematic. Anyway, and not at the front end, I don't think, but anyway, somewhere in here. And uh, that has a noise figure of uh, 4 nanovolts per root hertz. So let's give it a burl. And there we go yep still picking up our 50 hertz but once again we haven't gone off scale here now and there we go we're not we're almost exactly the same 
uh, noise floor as we got with the instrument itself. What was it? 31.3 nanovolts per root hertz. If we wait till it goes up there, we're only a couple of nanovolts above that. So, bingo, there you go. There's a good quality op amp for you. There it is, 33.7 for the record. Beautiful. Catch you next time.